Uh, our next speaker is uh, our special guest speaker. Um, David R. Williams is the Florence Sprague Norman and Laura Smart Norman Professor of Public Health at Harvard School of Public Health and uh, Professor of African and African American Studies and of Sociology at Harvard University. He is internationally recognized as a leading social scientist focused on social influences on health. His research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which race, racism, socioeconomic status, stress, health behaviors, and religious involvement can affect physical and mental health. The everyday discrimination scale that he developed is currently one of the most widely used measures to assess perceived discrimination in health studies. He is the author of more than 325 scholarly papers in scientific journals and edited collections, and his research has appeared in leading journals in sociology, psychology, medicine, public health, and epidemiology. He has served on the editorial board of 12 scientific journals and as a reviewer for over 60 journals. According to ICI Essential Science Indicators, he was one of the top 10 most cited researchers in the social sciences during the decade of 1995 to 2005. Please put your hands together and give a very warm welcome to our special guest speaker, <laughs> Professor David Williams. Thank you so very much. It's really good for me to be here. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be part of this important milestone. Uh, with the res in terms of we've made enormous progress. I've been following it from a distance. Uh, I'm here for a couple reasons. One is I, I certainly um, wanted to reconnect with my colleagues here who have been doing work in this area and I've had the privilege of, of being involved with them. I'm here also because um, when Yvonne Coghill tells me to jump, I usually ask how high. <laughs> And thirdly, I'm a part of a group of Americans who are facing the prospect that Donald Trump could actually become president, <laughs> are currently engaged in surreptitious visits to other countries <laughs> as we try to have a plan B for a place where we might reside if the worst happens in November. What I want to do today, though, is put into larger context um, some of what we are talking about today in terms of the issues of racial inequalities and discrimination, and what are some of both the challenges and the opportunities uh, we face. I want to begin by talking about the fact that race matters profoundly for health, and it's a global problem. In almost every country that is what I would call race conscious in the world, where we have data, race matters profoundly for health. Non-dominant racial groups have worse health than dominant racial groups. I'll give you an example. Um, this is life expectancy for indigenous men. Uh, looking at the Maori in New Zealand, Aboriginals in Australia, First Nation on reservation in Canada, and American Indians in the United States. And across the board, you can see in New Zealand, Canada, and the United States, the indigenous populations live seven years longer than the dominant group. And in Australia, it's three times as large. This is a little slow when I press it. Uh, just to give you a, another example, this is U.S. data, infant mortality in 2012. Uh, you can see race matters in terms of babies dying before their first birthday, with uh, blacks and American Indians have markedly higher uh, death rates than other racial groups. The same is true in the U.K. This is infant mortality by ethnicity for England and Wales in 2011, and you can see the excess much higher death rate um, in the first year of life for black Africans, Caribbean blacks, Pakistanis, 
um, all uh, do very poorly. Bangladeshis do very poorly in British data in general, but not on the infant mortality um, uh, question. Um, these disparities have existed and persist for a long time. And this is going to be one of my themes, that the res uh, success is not going to be a two-year project. Um, it, it has to be a long-term initiative, and I'm illustrating that way. I have data. This is the United States life expectancy at birth, uh, 1950 to 2010. Uh, you could see there was an eight-year gap between blacks and whites in how long they lived in 1950. There's a four-year gap in 2010, so there is absolute progress. Both groups have increased life expectancy over time, and we've cut the gap by half. However, the four-year gap is quite considerable. If we froze the life expectancy of whites and had the life expectancy of blacks improve at the average rate at which life expectancy has increased in the United States in the last 10 years, it will take 30 years to close that black-white gap of four years. In fact, you can see some of those numbers in the data. Look at the life expectancy of whites in 1950, 69.1 years. And let's ask how long did it take for blacks to catch up to the health that whites had in 1950. You see, it was not until 1990, 40 years later, that blacks got to where whites were um, in 1950. And if we, next slide, accelerated aging is one phenomenon I want to talk about. If we go to the next slide, okay, hold it. Um, I want to illustrate this phenomenon I want to talk about called weathering. And I want to give you a, a evidence of how profoundly the health of BME people are being affected by the larger bullying and harassment they experience, not only within the NHS, but within so many other domains of life. This is data from a study done in the United States by a professor called Arlene Geronimus. She asked a very simple question. She would look at all first births of, to women in the United States. So for an entire year, she looked at all women who gave birth to their first child. And she said, does the outcome of the baby, the baby's survival, vary by the age at which the mother had her first birth? Expecting that if a mother delayed childbearing from her teen years to her 20s, that she would do better, that the, the risk of the baby dying in the first month of life would be lower if the mother had her first birth in her 20s than her first birth as a teenager. Make sense? She found that that pattern was true for whites, but that the opposite pattern existed for blacks. These are the data. And that is the lowest risk of first birth was for women, thank you so much, was for women who had their first infant as a teenager. If they delayed childbearing to 20 to 24, the infant mortality rate, neonatal mortality rate, was higher than if they had it, the baby from 15 to 19. And it, it was a stunning finding. And her question was, how on earth could you make sense of this? That patterns could go in different directions for two groups living in the same society. And she came up with this notion of weathering, biological weathering. And her point is a very simple one. Your age captures not only how long you have lived, but if you are living in a bad environment, if you're living in a bad environment full of stress, of different types, your age is not only capturing how long you have lived, it's also capturing how long you've been exposed to bad environmental conditions, and therefore how physiologically compromised you are because of those exposures. We now have Two decades of research documenting that this phenomenon that she hypothesized is actually true. And I'll just give you two examples of data. The notion of weathering. Imagine water today dripping from the roof above to the sidewalk below. And if it dripped today, that's no problem. The sidewalk can sustain that. But if day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, there is a constant drip, drip, drip of water. The sidewalk below becomes weathered. It becomes eroded by the constant exposure to the stressors that it faces. So let me give you two examples of that illustrate this weathering that she talked about. 
and it, it's illustrating what it means to be a me, be a BME person in 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 race conscious societies. This is a ten item measure of allostatic load, is what researchers call it. It's a measure that captures physiological dysregulation across multiple biological systems. The point is, this is not self reported measures of health. Here are the mean scores on allostatic load by age and by race in the United States. You would expect the older you get, the more physiologically dysregulated you are, given the indicators we just used. But look at the allostatic load level of whites, age 55 to 64. It's four. The higher it is, the more physiologically dysregulated you are. Look at where African Americans or blacks get to the same level of physiological dysregulation 10 years earlier. At 45 to 54, blacks are where whites are 10 years later. There's a 10-year gap in physiological functioning between groups living in the same society. I'll give you another example. And this is research where scholars are using telomere length. Telomeres are capturing sequences of DNA at the level of every cell of your body. Um, and it's telomere length, the length of the telomere is used as a, in scientific research today, as a measure of biological aging. In this study, the researcher looks at blacks and whites at the same chronological age, black and white women at the same chronological age, and found that black women had shorter telomeres. That is, at the level of every cell of their body, they had aged biologically more rapidly than their white counterparts. And at the same chronological age, black women had accelerated biological aging of 7.5 years. So again, they were literally, physiologically, seven and a half years older than they were chronologically. What could possibly be responsible for such patterns? Well, we know that race in our contemporary societies everywhere is a crude marker of socioeconomic status or social class. We have made progress on race, but BME communities around the world still face long-standing barriers. Here's an example. This is median household income in the United States in 2013, and I'm translating it in a way that you can readily understand. For every dollar of household income white households had, Asian households had a dollar and 15 cents. Asian households is a group, 70% of whom are immigrants. They have levels of education that they came to the US with that is twice as high as the white population. Um, so it's not surprising that they're doing well because they have higher levels of human capital. But for every dollar of income that white households had, Hispanic households had 70 cents, American Indian households had 62 cents, black households had 59 cents. Do you know what is stunning about the 59 cents value? It's identical to the racial gap in income for blacks and whites in 1978. In 1978, black households earned 59 cents for every dollar whites earned. And that 78, I'm picking that year, it reflects the, the zenith of the gains as a result of the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s. And in 2013, black households have 59 cents. So this struggle that you engaged in is a long-term struggle and is not a two-year project. I'm gonna show you British data in a minute. But data on racial differences in income understates racial differences in economic circumstances. You have to look at wealth, because income captures the flow of resources into the household. Wealth tells us how much economic reserves households have. Um, you can't quite see it. There was a, something happened at the transformation. For every dollar of wealth that white households have in the US, black households have six cents, and Hispanic households have seven cents. That's the magnitude of racial gaps in wealth. Uh, to show you British data, for every pound of weekly income that the white majority earns in the UK, other whites, uh, mainly Eastern European whites, earn 79p, Indians earn 86p, Pakistanis 57p, Bangladeshis 52p, uh, Chinese 76p, Black Caribbean 77p, Black African 60p. So they're striking racial differences in income, the same pattern you see in the United States, I'm showing you, it's also true if we look at UK data. And if you look at wealth data, here's race and wealth in the UK, but let me put it in a way you can easily get it. For every pound of wealth that whites have, Caribbean blacks have 34p, Bangladeshis 10p, black Africans 7p. 
So you see that race in the UK also captures striking differences in socioeconomic resources. And health is strongly patterned by social class or socioeconomic status. Here's a very famous study. This is one of the studies by Michael, Sir Michael Mamet uh, using the Whitehall study of British civil servants. And you can see every higher level of professional grade of employment is associated with a lower risk of ischemic heart disease, but it's associated with literally everything they have studied in the Whitehall study, that your grade of employment predicts how long, how well you live, what, when you get ill, the power of social class. At one time, researchers thought that racial gaps, racial inequalities were simply a matter of social class. Now we know it's more profound than that. And I'll give you a quick example. The same is true for the UK, although I don't have data for the UK on life expectancy. Um, but I'll show you US data. Life expectancy is age 25. At the age 25, the average white person will live to 53.4 years, the average black person 48.4 years. So there's a five-year gap in life expectancy by race in America. If we look by education within race, the differences between Whites who have a college degree or more education and whites with only less than a high school graduation is 6.4 years, bigger than the black-white gap. It's really a profound point. The social class predicts big variations in health as well. The same is true if you look within the black population, 5.3 year gaps between blacks with high and low education. But at the same time, at every level of education, there is a racial gap in health. So white high school dropouts live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts, and that gap widens as education increases, so it's even larger among the college educated, a 4.2 year gap in life expectancy at age 25 between blacks and whites with the same level of education. And what you can also see here, if you look carefully at the data, the best of blacks here with the highest life expectancy are those who have a college degree or more education. Their life expectancy of 52.3 years is not only lower than that of whites with a college education, it's lower than that with a whites with only a high school completion. Suggesting that there are powerful forces linked to socioeconomic status or social class that drive health, but there's something else about race that matters profoundly. What is that? What is this added burden of race? We have an amazing body of data, increasingly globally, more for in the US, that in subtle and blatant ways, racism persists in contemporary society and it has a damaging impact on health. Let me give you an example of the persistence of racism in contemporary society and how deeply embedded it is, it is in the culture by showing you a study done in the United States. What a group of researchers did, and some researchers are really very creative, they created a database of American culture. They put in one data set the average books, magazines, newspaper articles a college-educated American would read over their entire lifetime. It's a database of 10 million words. What's beautiful about that, if you've put American culture in a database, you can say, when black appears in American culture, what adjective tends to co-occur with it? Poor, violent, religious, lazy, cheerful, dangerous. Those are the most commonly occurring adjectives with the word black. For the word white, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. For the fun of it, when female occurs, distant, warm, gentle, passive, male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. These are the 10 most common stereotypes with black and the 10 most common adjectives that co-occur with white. The coefficient, the number behind it, the strong, the bigger that number is, is the more closely tied the association between those two things are. So you can see with black, violent, lazy, dangerous. What that means is when a police officer sees a young black male and assumes he's violent and dangerous and acts prematurely, he's not a bad police officer. He's a normal American reflecting what he has been taught what he has been socialized as a part of being raised in that specific society. These negative stereotypes, and I don't have similar data for the UK, but these negative stereotypes exist in every society. They're in groups and out groups. And what research shows is they trigger racial discrimination. 
and they trigger racial discrimination not only in the big things, but also in the little things. So this is the everyday discrimination scale that was mentioned in my introduction that doesn't capture big things, but you're treated with less courtesy than others, treated with less respect, receive poorer service than others. People act as if they think you are not smart, as if they are afraid of you, if they think you are dishonest. These are little things. And you know you may think, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words cannot hurt me. What do these little things do?